Hello and welcome to this revision session for paper 3 in AQA A-level physics. So in today's revision session we're going to be looking at how to answer examination questions on A-level physics paper 3, focusing on the practical skills. So if we've been successful and learned in this revision session we should be able to answer A-level physics examination style questions, assess our understanding on A-level physics and understand what topics we need to improve upon for AQA A-level physics. So how should you prepare for this? This revision session. Well when completing your work in this revision session divide your piece of paper into two sections. Make the section on the left hand side larger than the right hand side and then this left hand side section write down your work and out and answers to the questions in the revision session and when you're doing this make sure you write in full sentences and show your full working out whilst in the right hand side write down any piece of information which you find useful any hints and tips on answering the questions from this revision session and at the end of the revision session write up these notes into a revision sheet for you to use independently. So how should you be revising AQA A-level physics? So the first step you should be doing is learning the key facts. Use your vision guides, class workbooks, student prep notes, the textbooks to learn the key knowledge of the course. You may wish to make mind maps or write out notes yourself. The second step is to retrieve your understanding by testing yourself. So use Caboodle, use Seneca, use uh, your own knowledge checkers to quickly test your own knowledge and you may wish to do this from your own cue cards. Uh, the third step is then practice and examination style questions. So use the exam prep books, homework books, uh, supervised study books, additional workbooks to then um, to then answer exam questions and mark your own work. So you may wish to download your own past papers to do this. So this the three steps of learn the key facts, then testing yourself, and then practicing exam style questions uh, can help you to answer these and revise questions in AQA A-level physics. So let's have a look at some practical skills questions for AQA A-level physics. So the first question says, a temperature sensor is connected to a data logger to monitor how the temperature of a fixed mass of recently boiled water varies with time t over an interval of 600 seconds. These data, this da this, these data are processed to produce the graph shown in figure 10. Determine the temperature of the water when t is 190 seconds. Determine the gradient g1 of the graph at t is 90 seconds. And then when t is 370 seconds, the temperature is 46.6 degrees Celsius and the gradient g2 is minus 0.0645. Evaluate theta r. So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer. Right, with this type of question, it's all about interpreting graphical information. There's nothing you you can do here about the practical, it's all about interpreting data from this graph. So the first thing is to work out theta one when the temperature is equal to 90 seconds. So what you would do is you would go along to 90 seconds on the X axis, look up on the graph and move across the Y axis and you'll see it's about 61 degrees Celsius. Now the next one is determine the gradient G1 at time is 190 seconds. So you're gonna have to work out the gradient of your graph but it's a curving graph so we need to draw a tangent so you should be drawing a tangent which intersects the line at 190 seconds you then draw your right angle triangle in on your gradient and you get your value to be minus 9.57 times 10 to the minus 2 now it's important to note it should be a minus value because the graph is going downwards now in the last one you've got to work out theta r now you are given an equation for this now it's important to note you were given g1 Oh, so you've worked out G1 from the previous question. You've got theta 1 from the previous question as well. You told theta 2. You told, told G2. So it's a case of popping in all the numbers and working it through to get 17.3 degrees. Now the next question says, it can be shown that when a hot object at temperature theta is allowed to cool in a draft, the rate at which the temperature decreases is directly proportional to the temperature difference between the object and the surroundings. A student realises that this will decrease exponentially with time and designs an experiment in which two temperature sensors are connected to a data logger. Sensor 1 is placed in a beaker of recently boiled water. Sensor 2 is, measures the air temperature in the room. The data logger is programmed to record the output from the sensors as the water cools for 600 seconds. The output data from the sensor is processed to produce the graph as shown in figure 11. So this change will decrease exponentially in the same way as the potential difference across the discharging capacitor decreases with time. When a, cap a capacitor discharges, the PD across the capacitor falls to one, of, 1 over E of an initial value of a time called the time constant. Electrical engineers assume the capacitor becomes fully discharged in a time equal to 5 time constants. Estimate the time taken for the water to cool down to room temperature. So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer. 
Right, for this question, it is trying to link in capacitors and exponentiality, but it's a case of just using the graph available to you. So what you've got to do is consider what theta and minus theta r is going to be. So you've got to correctly evaluate that. So you look on your graph and theta zero, the starting temperature is 89 degrees Celsius, and then theta r, you can work out on the graph if the line was going directly along, because that's measuring the room temperature in the room, so therefore that is 21 degrees Celsius. So theta zero minus theta r, is going to be equal to 68 degrees Celsius. Now we can then say, we can then divide that by E because we're saying it falls to one E of the value. Uh, so we can work that through. And then we also obviously will add in our um, our value. So we can say, well, the difference is 68. We divide it by E to get 25. We then add in our room temperature again because we're looking at the time taken to cool down to room temperature. So therefore we do 25 plus 21 equals 46. Now it also indicates to us how can we work out what our time constant is going to be. Well, then we can work up by using the axis. We can work this off. So we know that it's the time taken to fall by 46. So therefore what we do is we go from 89 to 46 and work out that particular so 89 uh, to the 46 value there. So what you can do is read through the graph and you see on the graph that to go to that particular value, it is about 390 seconds. Now at that point, that tells us what our time constant is. So we've worked out our time constant to be 390 seconds. Now it says in the question, it says the time for it to fully cool down is equal to five time constants because that's the time it takes for it to be fully discharged. So we then multiply our answer by five and we get an answer of about 1,950 seconds. The next question says, another student carries out the experiment using the same mass of recently boiled water and a beaker as before. The output data for sensor 1 from the student's experiments are shown in figure 12. Account for the differences between these results and the way they are displayed with those shown in figure 11. You should include appropriate quantitative data in your answer. So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer. Right, so how do you answer this particular question? Well, it's looking at how it was different to our previous graph. So pretty much what you're doing is you're looking at the graph in the previous question and you're looking at this graph and you're going to just talk about the differences. Now, like it says in the question, it wants quantitative data to so give numerical values. So let's look at the two graphs and how they're different. Firstly, the starting temperature is lower. Second, so the starting temperature in this one is 86, whilst in the previous one it was 89 degrees. It also indicates to us that it's leveled off at the room temperature temperature and we know here it's leveling off at about 37.9 degrees so as a result the room temperature therefore is higher and therefore the draft is also less because it's not decreasing as quickly because it only cooled by 38 degrees after 600 seconds so therefore we can indicate that that was an issue now the other thing is to note and look at the graph so you can tell quite quickly that the sample rate of the data logger was longer because you've got these discrete drops as we're going through it so the samples here you can see from your graph are recorded every 20 seconds you can see it by the drops which they take place so therefore the original experiment didn't have these drops so therefore it's much higher so you've got to be able to compare and contrast data the next question says to reduce the impact of a random error the student takes several measures of a diameter at different points along a wire so that he can calculate a mean value for d these measurements are shown in the table use the data from table 3 to determine the percentage uncertainty in the student's results for d so pause the video now then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer Right, to work out percentage uncertainty when you're given a set of repeats is you've got to firstly work out the mean value by adding up all the values and divide by the number of values that you've got, but also bear in mind you exclude anomalies if there are any. I don't believe there are any in this experiment. So you work out your mean to be 0.57 millimetres. Now the uncertainty and the absolute uncertainty for repeated values is going to be half of the range. So the range is the biggest number minus the smallest number, and you do half of that, and therefore to work out your percentage uncertainty it's your absolute uncertainty which is half of the range divided by the mean times by 100 which is 0 0.70 percent the next question says this question is about an experiment with a retractable steel tape measure. The tape measure is placed at the edge of the bench and about one meter of the steel tape is extended so it overhangs the bench. The tape is then locked in this position to stop it from retracting. A student measures the dimensions X and Y and the horizontal vertical displacements of the free end of the tape are shown in figure seven. So describe a suitable procedure that the student could measure Y and then by changing the extension of the tape, the student obtains further values of X and Y. Suggest why the student chose to make all measurements of X greater than seven. 70 degrees centimeters sorry 70 centimeters so pause the video now then unpause the video and you want to go through your answer 
Right, for this question, you're just going to consider the information and think about how you can get a accurate value of y. So the technique you would do is you would have a meter ruler made vertical with a set square on the in contact with the floor to ensure that the ruler is vertical. You would then measure the height from the free end of the tape to the height of the tape above the bench, and the y is the difference in these heights. Or you could use a meter ruler or a straight edge along the actual bench so you can see what the straight edge will be and then use an additional ruler to ensure that you can measure that difference between that and the end of the ruler I mean the end oh yeah the end of the tape but you've also got to always think how can you make your ruler vertical so you've always got to talk about making them vertical by using a set square now this next question is asking you to consider why you do certain things in experiment as an experimental technique and the important thing to note is you want to use values above 70 centimeters because it will decrease the percentage uncertainty because your absolute uncertainty is fixed but when you divide it by a bigger value you're going to get a lower percentage uncertainty because percentage uncertainty is absolute divided by the value times by 100 so therefore you'll get a lower percentage uncertainty not absolute but percentage so when you're changing the values you're measuring it tends to be to change the percentage uncertainty the next question says, the data from the experiment suggests that y is equal to ax to the power n, where n is an integer and a is a constant. The data is used to plot the graph in figure 8. Determine n using figure 8. So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer. Right, it's important to note that when you've got a log y against a log x graph and you're going to have y a x to the power n, it's important to know that this tells you that the gradient is, is actually going to be the power of the x, the, the power which is next to x, so x to the power n, so n is in fact going to be the gradient of the line. That's an important fact you've got to know for a log y against log x graph. In that format, the gradient of the line is going to be the power value on the x value so what you've got to do in this question is draw in your correct line of best fit and you can see on the screen where it tells you to place your correct line of best fit and you're then going to work out your value for n by working out the gradient and obviously you're rounded to the nearest integer why is that because it tells you in the question that n is an integer so therefore you should be getting n is equal to 4. The next question says, explain how the numerical value of A can be obtained from figure 8. So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer. Right, so as well as being able to understand on a log y against log x uh, graph what the gradient represents, it's important that you can also work out what the value multiplied by the x value is going to be. Now, how you can work it through is as follows. You can no you know that the y that the y intercept will be equal to the power will be equal to log a. So what you can do is you can draw in your line and derive what the y intercept is. And at that point, we can say that that equals equals log a so therefore you can uh, reverse that by saying well you can then work it through by saying a is equal to 10 to the power of the y intercept so you would work it through like that and get your answer through so when you work it through you can probably get your y intercept to be about 0 0.73 0 0.74 so therefore a is equal to 10 of the power 0 0.73 now it's important that this is the case because we know log y is equal to n log x plus log a so that tells us that our y intercept when our of our equation y equals mx plus c that that our plus c is going to be log a so that's how you can work out values of a in this context the next question says estimate the order of magnitude of a and use this data from the table okay to give your answer with an appropriate unit so pause the video now then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer Right, so how do you answer this particular question? Well, we can work out that we said before that a that we say y is equal to a x to the power of n. So what we can do is we can then change this round to make a the subject. So a therefore is equal to y over x to the power of n. Now it's important to note that in the question we have previously worked out what n is. n is equal to 4. It's the gradient of the line. So what you can then then do is for all of the values you can work it through by saying for any of the rows you could just do uh, 61.2 
over 132.4 to the power of 4 and work out your value like that. And then you can see from the graph they're all going to be to the magnitude of 10 to the minus 7. So the answer is going to be 10 to the minus 7. Now it's asking what the unit is going to be. Well, we've noticed that y is in centimetres and x is in centimetres. But it, it, the, the power of x that x is, being, is, is multiplied to is to the power of 4. So we're actually saying it's centimetres over centimetres to the the power of 4. So therefore when we work it through and cancel it through it's centimetres to the minus 3 and that's the units being given. The next question says, this question is about an experiment to estimate absolute zero. Figure A, for figure 9A to figure 9D shows the stages of the procedure carried out by a student. An empty flask fitted with a tube and an open valve is placed in water bath H containing hot water. The air inside the flask is allowed to come into thermal equilibrium with the water. The valve is then closed, trapping a certain air volume of air as shown in 9A. The flask is inverted and placed in water bath C, in which the water is at room temperature. The air inside the flask is again allowed to come into thermal equilibrium with the water as shown in figure 9b. The valve is opened and some water enters the flask as shown in 9c. The depth of the inverted flask is adjusted to until the water level inside the flask is the same level as the water in the water bath. The valve is then closed, trapping air and water inside the flask as shown in figure 9d. So estimate the volume of air in the flask in 9c and is less than the volume of the air in the flask in 9d. So pause the video now. Then unpause the video and you'll want to go through your answer. Right, so it's talking about, well, what's actually going on in this situation? Now, we're thinking about pressure uh, in this situation and temperature because we're linking it into the volume of a gas. So we can say that why is the volume of air in, in C less than the volume of air in D? Well, when you look at the situation and what's actually going on, you can see quite clearly that the pressure of the air in C is going to be greater than the pressure of the air in D, or you could argue the vice versa. And so therefore, because the temperature is the same, we know what Boyle's law is. PV equals a constant. So we can say that when pressure increases in one, volume decreases in another to keep the value constant. And so therefore, that's why the volume will change. The next question says, explain why Charles's law can be applied to compare the air in the flask in 9A with the air in the flask in 9D. So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer. Right, well, this question is asking you just to basically understand what Charles's law is. So it's the idea that here the mass of the air in both of those beakers is going to be the same because they've not been adjusted and they've got the same pressure. So therefore, any suggestion that the temperature is constant, that the volume is constant and that the pressure has therefore changed. So therefore, it's the idea that there's the same moles of gas or the same amount of gas there. So therefore, you've got to understand that if the temperature is constant, then the volume will be constant. The next question says the flask is removed from water bath C and then the valve and the stopper are removed. The volume of the flask is V1. The flask is then completely refilled with water and the valve and the stopper are replaced. The volume of water in the flask is now V2. The volumes V1 and V2 are shaded in parts figure 10. Explain how V1 and V2 can be determined. In your answer, identify the suitable measuring instrument and the suitable procedure to eliminate a possible systematic error. So pause the video now then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer. Right, well in these types of questions, it's always trying to work out what is being asked of you. And fundamentally, what they're asking you is how can you measure volume of water, of a liquid? So what would the method be? So you would probably use either a measuring cylinder or a graduated beaker. So what you would therefore do is you would get the liquid, you would then pour it into the measuring cylinder or the graduated beaker, ensuring it's on a flat surface, and then you would then measure the level that the volume rises to with the eye level with the bottom of the meniscus point in your water liquid. So this will be there to avoid parallax error because if you weren't looking directly parallel with the water level, well therefore you would have a parallax error. So it's important here, it looks a very challenging question, but all it's asking you to do is how do you work out volume of a liquid. So I hope you've enjoyed this particular revision session where we've looked at how we can answer A-level physics examination style questions for paper three. We've assessed our understanding on A-level physics for paper three and understand what topics we need to improve upon for A-level physics. So thank you very much for watching this particular revision session on A-level physics paper three. Thank you very much and have a lovely day.